Southern Fried True Crime covers cases that are not suitable for young listeners, and there may also be some explicit language used. Listener discretion is advised. Missing person cases are gut-wrenching. Sometimes, even when you get some answers, you never really get closure. It's the not knowing that haunts loved ones. I can only imagine what it feels like as a mother, to try to go to sleep every night without knowing where your child is. I don't think it matters whether your child is 8 or 18. They are still your baby. Even as the years drag by and you believe they are dead, the not knowing gnaws a hole in your heart that can never be filled. On Sunday, January 2nd in the year 2000, 18-year-old Zeb Quinn told his mother Denise he would be home after he got off work at 9 p.m. But Zeb never came home, and Denise never heard from her son again. An investigation would uncover the last person seen with Zeb was a guy named Jason Owens. After giving an initial statement to detectives, Owens became uncooperative. With the lead person of interest refusing to help, Zeb's case grew stagnant. Authorities had their suspicions that foul play was involved, but it wasn't until two other people went missing in 2015 that investigators would hear about what supposedly happened to Zeb Quinn. It was a bizarre, gruesome confession. And really, even then, authorities and Zeb's family were left with more questions than answers. Welcome to episode 169, The Vanishing of Zeb Quinn. Zeb Wayne Quinn was born in May of 1981 in Asheville, North Carolina, to parents Denise Velakis, a pediatric intensive care nurse, and Jerry Quinn, a bartender. When Zeb was two years old, the Quinns divorced, and Denise raised Zeb and his older sister Brandy mostly on her own, as Jerry wasn't around much. Jerry would later open his own bar called the Biltmore Tavern, named for the famed Biltmore Estate in Asheville, the largest privately owned house in the U.S., though it's now a museum and tourist attraction. This little mountain escape, as he called it, was built by George Washington Vanderbilt II and is a great example of the lavish homes built with new money during the Gilded Age. Jerry's Tavern, described by Spin Magazine as an ashen roadhouse wedged between train tracks and a spotlight just down the road from its namesake, did later seem to bring father and son together. He had taught his son to play pool there and had given Zeb a pool cue as a gift not long before he went missing. But Denise a busy neonatal nurse at St. Joseph Mission Hospital did pretty much raise her kids on her own, and it couldn't have been easy. But she had a good job and spent most of her free time with her kids. Zeb was definitely a proud mama's boy. He was very close to her. And Brandy was also close to her mom. After she graduated, she worked at the hospital with Denise. Zeb and his sister were also very close. Watching Brandy in interviews, when she smiles, you can see Zeb in her features. They look alike in photos, but seeing her speak, Zeb really just shines through. They have the same sweet smile. As a kid, Zeb played sports and was in the Boy Scouts, but he never really had any close friends besides Brandy. Denise told Investigation Discoveries Disappeared, that Zeb had a learning disability, which caused him to have trouble with reading comprehension. She thought that was why he had trouble fitting in with his peers. He did long to fit in, but he just never really had any close friends, much less a best friend. In the fall of 1995, Zeb started his freshman year at Robertson High School in Asheville. That year, he joined the junior ROTC and loved the program. He finally felt a sense of camaraderie, and he really enjoyed the community service aspect, 
which fits with his caring nature. He stayed in the ROTC all four years of high school, and his mom and sister thought he might have a future in the military. But while attending Robertson High, Zeb started an after-school job in the electronics department at the Hendersonville Road Walmart in Asheville. He loved it. He was a dedicated employee who never called in sick. His supervisor, Patty, told the Asheville Citizen Times, quote, he would call me every morning just to talk or to see if he'd gotten everything done he was supposed to. She added, he's the kind of guy I'd want my daughter to marry. Zeb was pretty much adored universally by his co-workers, and Walmart became his second home. Even when he wasn't on the clock, Zeb could be found hanging around the store. It seems that at Walmart, he had really found a community of friends that had been missing in his life. After graduating from Robertson High in 1999, Zeb continued to live at home with his mom and kept working at Walmart while starting classes at a community college. Even though he was now an adult, Zeb almost never came home late without calling or paging, and he would always let Denise know where he was. He stood five foot ten inches tall, with a slim build and thick black hair. In every photo, he is smiling sweetly. He looks like the epitome of the nice, naive kid everyone describes. 1999 was a fun year. There was a feeling of change in the air with the coming of a new millennium. Grunge seemed to be fading as pop stars ruled the charts with a number of earworm songs that are still hanging around over 20 years later. The Backstreet Boys had I Want It That Way, and it seems like we will never get rid of Smash Mouth's All Star. And everyone thought the computers would fail the entire world when the clock struck midnight on the year 2000. The Y2K New Year's Eve parties that year were epic. But Zeb Quinn wasn't much of a party boy. He was a hard worker. But he also had another reason for staying home that New Year's Eve that we'll get into. But when his mom got home that night, she found Zeb on his PlayStation. She didn't know anything else was going on. Her hardworking boy had stayed home that once-in-a-lifetime New Year's Eve. He was a hard worker and had recently been talking about taking management training classes so he could be promoted up the chain at Walmart. He really loved it there. He felt he had a bright and exciting future ahead of him. The sky was the limit for the 18-year-old. But Zeb would never see much of the new millennium and the possibilities it held for him. On Sunday, January 2nd, 2000, Zeb and Denise were both scheduled to work until around 9 o'clock that night. Before leaving the house for their shifts, they hugged each other goodbye and said their I love yous. It would be the last hug for Denise, the last time she could tell her baby I love you. At around 9.30 p.m., Denise paged Zeb to see if he wanted to get dinner with her and her fiancé. When he didn't respond, Denise thought maybe he was working later than 9 o'clock. No big deal. Not thinking much of it, Denise and her fiancé, Costa, went to dinner without her son. When they got home, Zeb still wasn't there, so Denise sent another page. Again, he didn't reply. At this point, he started to worry. It was very uncharacteristic of Zeb to not tell her he was going to be late. And not answering two pages? It was almost unheard of. It had only happened one other time, and that didn't make Denise feel any better. The last time, he had borrowed her Jeep without asking for permission and hung out with a girl Denise didn't get a good feeling about. He had apologized profusely to his mom about this incident. At around 10.30 p.m., Denise called Walmart to see if Zeb was still working. She was told he had clocked out just after 9 p.m. Denise checked around with other people who might know where Zeb was, but no one had seen him. Her panic began escalating. As the hours passed and Zeb still didn't return home, Denise grew more and more worried. She continued paging Zeb through the night, but he never answered. This was not like the night he had hung out with that girl. This was serious. In the morning, Denise called family members and close friends again 
hoping one of them had heard from Zeb, but no one had. Desperate for answers, Denise even called the home of 19-year-old Misty Taylor, that young woman Zeb had been with the night he took Denise's Jeep. Zeb had become infatuated after meeting Misty at a party in early December 1999. But just like everyone else, Misty said she didn't know where Zeb was. By the late afternoon, Denise felt she had no other choice but to file a missing person report with the Asheville Police Department. According to the Citizen Times, at first, Asheville detectives told Denise there wasn't much they could do. Zeb was a legal adult who hadn't been gone that long. Investigators said he had likely just run off and would be back any time. Denise did not agree. Nothing about Zeb's disappearance seemed runaway to her. He didn't take any personal belongings with him. His clothes, including his winter coat, his contact solution, and his money were all left at home. Clearly, wherever Zeb had gone, he didn't intend to be gone for long. Also, Denise knew that Zeb loved his job and his classes at AB Tech, which were going to start back up soon. He wasn't a troubled kid. He wasn't into drugs or anything. He had a bright future ahead of him. It did not make sense that he would run away. His relationship with Misty was about the only concern, but it seemed like a fleeting thing, like Zeb would soon forget about this girl who wasn't exactly available anyway. While detectives failed to take Denise's concerns seriously, she continued searching for her son. She looked everywhere she knew to look and talked to everyone she knew to talk to. But no one had seen or heard from Zeb since he clocked out at around 9 p.m. on January 2nd. Finally, on the morning of January 4th, Denise got a lead. But it didn't bring relief, only more desperation. Zeb's supervisor, Patty, called Denise to say she had just received a phone call from a man claiming to be Zeb. When Patty answered the phone at Walmart, the man said, This is Zeb Quinn, and I'm calling to let you know I won't be into work today. I'm sick. Patty was immediately suspicious for two reasons. One, she knew Zeb, and the caller sounded nothing like him. And two, Zeb never called in sick to work. Sensing something was wrong, Patty asked the man, what department is it that you work in again? He responded, electronics. And then Patty asked a tougher question. What hours were you scheduled to work today? The man hesitated and then hung up. Patty immediately dialed star 69, which for those of you who don't know is a call return feature that automatically dials your last incoming call. The call went back to a place called Volvo Construction Company. Patty then called Denise and told her what happened. Denise called the investigators, who said they would head to the store to interview Patty. Before detectives arrived, Patty spoke with her employees and told them about the call. This proved to be very helpful, as the employees informed Patty that Zeb was friends with a 20-year-old night stalker at Walmart who also worked at Volvo Construction. His name was Jason Owens. Born and raised in Leicester, North Carolina, about 20 minutes from Asheville, Robert Jason Owens did not have a father figure in his life. His mother, Betsy, struggled with drug addiction, leaving Jason to be mostly raised by his grandmother, Bertha. Jason owned a rural property with a double-wide trailer at 1 Owens Cove Road, a short residential road located right off Hooker's Gap Road in Leicester. His grandma, Bertha, lived across the road in a smaller trailer at 8 Owens Kevin Road. While working as a night stalker at Walmart, Jason had befriended Zeb, and sometimes they went fishing together. And they also played pool, often at the Biltmore Tavern, Zeb's dad's bar. Zeb and Jason's co-workers told Patty, and eventually detectives, that they actually saw the two men talking to each other on the night of Zeb's disappearance. They spoke for a while in the store, and then later, after Zeb clocked out, they left together. The co-workers watched as they got into separate vehicles. Jason drove off in his truck, with Zeb following behind in his small Mazda. That was the last time any of them saw Zeb alive. 
After hearing what co-workers had to say, detectives went to Volvo Construction to speak with Jason Owens. When asked about the traced call to Patty, Jason admitted to making the call, explaining that Zeb had called and begged him to call in sick for him. Jason told detectives he wasn't sure why Zeb didn't call in sick himself. He didn't ask. He just thought he was doing Zeb a favor. Knowing Jason Owens was the last person to see Zeb before he disappeared, detectives asked him about what happened on January 2nd. Jason said he ran into Zeb that night at Walmart. During their chat, Zeb mentioned that he had been saving up to buy a newer car. His light blue 1990 Mazda Protégé was holding up, but he was looking for something newer and sportier. Jason said he told Zeb he knew of a Mitsubishi Eclipse for sale out on Leicester Highway. He offered to show the car to Zeb after he got off work, and Zeb agreed to go. As a side note, reports differ, but some say there was a closed dealership that Jason meant to show Zeb. But searching 22 years later, there are tons of possible dealers in the Asheville area and a few used dealers that pop up for Leicester Highway. After Zeb clocked out, he and Jason walked to the parking lot. They left separately, but stopped at a nearby convenience store to buy drinks. Then, they left. You can see on CCTV footage that Zeb followed Jason south down Hendersonville Road. Then from there, Jason said they turned onto Long Shoals Road. Not long after the turn, Jason said that Zeb flashed his headlights at him, signaling that he needed to pull over. They came to a stop near the entrance to Robertson High School. Zeb got out of the car and walked up to Jason's truck. He explained that he had received an urgent page. He asked Jason if he had a cell phone, but Jason said he didn't. So Zeb said he needed to go find a payphone and he would be right back. Then Jason said Zeb returned around 10 to 15 minutes later. He told detectives that something must have happened during that short time because according to Jason, when Zeb pulled up, he was in such a frantic, concerned, and agitated state that he rear-ended Jason's truck. He said Zeb ran up to him and apologized and promised to pay for the damage. Then suddenly, Zeb said he got another page. He told Jason he couldn't go to look at the eclipse now. And then Jason said he raced away. Jason told detectives he didn't hear from Zeb again until two days later, on the 4th, when he called and begged him to call in sick for him. Detectives were suspicious of Jason's story. If he and Zeb were really headed to Leicester to see the car, they would not have taken Long Shoals Road. Leicester is northwest of Walmart, while Long Shoals Road is south. It didn't make sense for the two men to take that road. It was way out of the way. I may hear from some locals about this, and if the info is wrong, I am sorry. I did stare at maps of Asheville and Leicester until I about went blind, trying to figure out this night. But this is what the police said. Anyway, detectives told Denise about their conversation with Jason. She said she had no idea what would upset Zeb as much as Jason described. She never got a call back from her pages. This made Jason's story even more suspicious. Investigators looked further into his story. They were able to verify that he and Zeb did go to the gas station. Surveillance footage showed them purchasing drinks at 9.14 p.m. and then exiting the store. Two minutes later, Jason's truck drove by the gas pumps with Zeb following behind in his car. So that part of the story was at least true. They needed Zeb's pager records to corroborate the rest of the story. While detectives waited for the records to come back, they went to Volvo Construction to speak with Jason's supervisor. They learned that on the morning after Zeb disappeared, Jason was a no-call no-show for his 6 a.m. shift. Hours after his shift was supposed to start, Jason called and said he had been in a car accident. He had been pulling out from the Waffle House on Long Shoals Road when he was hit by another car. Jason told his supervisor he went to urgent care instead of coming to work. He had a doctor's note to prove he was treated for a head wound and a fractured rib. Investigators were intrigued by the supervisor's statement for many reasons. 
Jason had never mentioned the Waffle House accident to them, and there had been no police reports of an accident in front of the Waffle House that morning. Then they looked over Jason's truck and found minimal damage, just a few dings here and there. Nothing to suggest he had been in a collision earlier that day. The detectives didn't believe Jason's Waffle House wreck story, but it wasn't enough to arrest him, so they kept digging. Investigators looked into other people Zeb was close to. They soon learned about Misty Taylor, the young woman Zeb had become infatuated with shortly before his disappearance. I have yet to find a contemporary photo of Misty over 20 years ago, but she is described as a petite girl with long blonde curly hair. I am only mentioning her looks and lack of photos online for a reason I'll get to shortly, so please hold your emails. Detectives learned that Zeb and Misty frequently spent long periods of time talking on the phone. Not long after they started talking, Misty admitted she had a baby and a boyfriend named Wesley Smith. Zeb had actually met Misty at Costa's kitchen. It was owned by Costa Vlahakis, his mom's fiance, and Misty's mother Tamara waited tables there. According to Spin Magazine, Anna Vlahakis, Costa's daughter, said that, quote, all Misty talked about was how bad Wes was to her. Anna claimed that she hung out with Zeb and Misty, but then a lot of people talked to the spin writer more easily than they had the local press, and especially to the cops. Everyone seemed to have warned Zeb about Misty and her drama. But Zeb was so into Misty that he didn't care about the baggage and warnings from others. He continued to fall more and more for her. His family felt like their friendship clouded his judgment and he started doing things he had never done before. Even though a Walmart buddy of his named Gary later told Spin Magazine, quote, I don't think he had sex with her. He was a virgin. And Gary supported the infatuation others felt was one-sided. All he talked about was this girl. He also said he told Zeb that girls like that like to make you think they want more. Gross, Gary. Anyway. Denise told Disappeared the story about the night Zeb took her Jeep without asking. He picked up Misty, her baby, and another kid Misty was babysitting, and took them all to the mall. Denise had to page Zeb three times before he responded. She couldn't believe he would do something like that. It was so out of character. As Zeb and Misty's relationship deepened, Zeb told his mom, sister, and friends all about Misty and her problems. He told them that Misty had confided in him about Wes's controlling and abusive behavior. Zeb said it was so bad that he and Misty had to keep their friendship a secret. She was afraid of what Wes would do if he found out. After hearing things like this, everyone would warn Zeb that Misty was not a good match for him. But Zeb was infatuated, and no one could change his mind. He continued talking to her in secret. Pam Browning, who said she was a friend of Zeb's dad, told Spin Magazine that she saw Zeb storm off after an upsetting phone call. He later said that Wes and his buddies were threatening him to stay away from Misty. Before the month of December 1999 was up, Zeb got really wrapped up into Misty and her drama. On two separate occasions, he told his supervisor Patty about some pretty serious incidents. Zeb said that one night, Misty called him all distraught because Wes had found out she was talking to Zeb, which would have been around the time the friend of his dad's was talking about the upsetting phone call. Another time, Zeb went to Misty's house, not knowing Wes would be there. It's unclear what happened next, if Wes saw Zeb or if Zeb was able to get away unseen. All we know is that Zeb told Patty that he was scared. Patty told the Citizen Times, quote, Zeb had made comments in this store that his life had been threatened. She said she warned Zeb to stay away from Misty, but he didn't listen. On New Year's Eve 1999, Zeb stayed home and talked to Misty on the phone for most of the night. It was the last time he spoke to her. Two days later, on the day of his disappearance, Zeb told his grandma, Sylvia, he hadn't heard from Misty since New Year's Eve. 
He was worried about her, so he decided to call and check on her. He dialed Misty's number, then almost immediately hung up the phone in a panic. He told his grandma that he forgot to dial star 67 to block his number. Now, Wes could see that he had called. He told his grandma, I'm in trouble now. I'm in big trouble now. After learning about Misty's connection to Zeb, detectives went to interview her. When they asked her about her relationship with Zeb, she said they were just acquaintances. Detectives felt like she was minimizing their relationship. Acquaintances don't spend hours talking on the phone with each other. Detectives pushed Misty to give them more answers, but she continued to downplay her relationship with Zeb, so they asked her where she was on the night of his disappearance. Misty said she was at her parents' home with Wes and their baby. Ironically, Zeb's paternal Aunt Ina was also there because she was starting a business with Misty's mother. They were talking about opening their own restaurant. This all seems kind of strange, but actually, Zeb didn't know his Aunt Ina that well. He wasn't close with his dad's side of the family. It was a coincidence that she was doing business with Tamara, who worked for his mom's fiancé at Costa's Kitchen. It feels like a small town where everyone knew everyone else. Asheville had about 70,000 people at the time, but Arden, where Zeb lived, was home to about 20,000 people, and Fletcher, where Costa's Kitchen and the Taylors lived, had about 7,000. Fletcher and Arden are less than three miles apart, and Fletcher is the closest to Asheville at four miles. So, it was a small community in that sense. Small towns on the way to Asheville, which was still relatively small itself. Detectives then interviewed Wesley Smith, and he told them the same story. He was at the Taylor home with Misty, the baby, and Zeb's aunt, Ina Estridge. The Taylors owned a double-wide trailer, and on the night of January 2nd, Tamara and Marvin Taylor both confirmed they were home all night hanging out with Una Estridge, Zeb's aunt, talking about the plans for a restaurant, and that Misty and Wes were there along with the baby. And both Wes and Misty told detectives they did not know a Jason Owens. Investigators were suspicious of Misty and Wes's stories, but they didn't have enough probable cause to make an arrest. They would have to remain persons of interest. Days after speaking with Misty and Wes, detectives obtained Zeb's pager records. They were particularly interested in finding out who allegedly paged Zeb while he and Owens were driving down Long Shoals Road. Records showed that on the night of his disappearance, Zeb only received pages from two numbers. One belonged to Denise, as expected. The other one was from the home of Zeb's Aunt Ina. This stood out to detectives because they knew Zeb rarely spoke to Ina. He was not close to his father Jerry's side of the family. Hell, he had only recently tentatively reconnected with his dad. Detectives then went to interview Ina. She said she didn't page Zeb that night and she couldn't have because she was at Misty Taylor's home. Ina told detectives something interesting, though. When she got home, she had a missed call from her brother Jerry's apartment. When detectives compared the time of Jerry's call to the time of the page from Ina's, they were only three minutes apart. Ina later told police her phone records showed a number of mysterious phone calls made from her apartment over the days after Zeb went missing. She said, quote, I wasn't ever at home. When I got home those days, my phone was moved to other parts of the house. One day, a picture from my wall was down and it was broken. I was really scared. No one has a key to my apartment. Ina always maintained that she didn't know where Zeb had gone. She told the Citizen Times, I could never do anything to harm a hair on that boy's head. I love him. I'd never hide him out or hide anything from his mother. I'm just like everyone else. I just want to know what happened to Zeb. Detectives went to interview Zeb's dad, Jerry, about the call to Ina's apartment on the night of January 2nd. Jerry said he didn't make the call to Ina's. He was working at that time, and he had no idea who could have made the call. At first, investigators entertained the idea that maybe Zeb was the one who made the call 
from Jerry's. Maybe he went there, leaving Jason on Long Shoals Road. But when detectives looked at a map, they thought it wasn't possible. He couldn't have driven to Jerry's place, made the call, and then returned to Jason in 10 to 15 minutes. It would have taken a minimum of 30 minutes. But, I mean, this is based on believing that Jason was telling the truth. Maybe Misty had gone to Ina's and paged Zeb, and then he went to his dad's to call Misty back, and then drove out to meet Jason after. We only have Jason's word. Misty wasn't talking. And it's not outside of the realm of possibility that she had a way into Ina's house. Her mother and Ina were good friends. Still, the page from Ina's house and the call from Jerry just added to the pile of mysteries that the detectives couldn't solve. They were like puzzle pieces that didn't fit anywhere. Later, even with more pieces added to the puzzle, these two pieces would never fit. On the night of January 16th, exactly two weeks after Zeb disappeared, Denise received a call from a co-worker at Mission Hospital. She told Denise that on her way into work, she noticed Zeb's car in the parking lot of the Little Pig's Barbecue Restaurant, which was near the hospital. The co-worker said she was positive it was Zeb's car. They had gone to school together, and she recognized his light blue Mazda. After getting off the phone, Denise immediately called the police. Responding officers found Zeb's Mazda right where the co-worker said it would be. It was parked right next to the big road as if it was meant to be noticed. The headlights were on and the windows were cracked. Drawn on the back window in orange-pink lipstick was a large pair of lips situated between two exclamation points. When officers looked inside, they were shocked to see a Labrador Retriever mixed puppy. Despite being covered in feces, the black dog was alive and healthy. Officers were convinced the puppy was left inside specifically to draw attention to the car. People often pay attention to dogs and cars, and thankfully, many will call the police to make a report if a dog is left inside a car for too long. It was the perfect way to get someone to alert police to the car quickly. Once the puppy was out of the car, officers continued looking over the inside. They immediately noticed that the driver's side seat was positioned close to the steering wheel, which indicated that the last person to drive the car was short in stature. Or, a tall person could have been smart enough to push the seat closer to the steering wheel to try and throw off authorities. Investigators also found an old motel room key card with no logo, a small-sized jacket that clearly did not belong to Zeb, and several empty soda bottles. Later, when crime scene technicians combed the interior, they collected blonde hairs and fibers. Detectives spoke with the barbecue restaurant employees and found that the Mazda had not been there at around 5 p.m. the day before, which meant that someone had very recently left the car there. The big question was, had that person been Zeb? His mother pointed out months later in an August 2000 interview with the Citizen Times that Zeb knew she and Brandy did not park on that side of the hospital. He wouldn't have left it there if he wanted us to find it. So maybe it was a coincidence. The car was parked as close to the road as possible, with the lights left on. And then there is the puppy. If no one noticed the car at night with lights on, surely they would see the puppy in the daylight and call it in. And the lipstick on the back window? That feels like a red herring. Something done purposely to throw police off. For sure, someone wanted Zeb's car to be found. But whether or not it was meant for Denise and Brandy to see is up for debate. Would that person even know his family worked at the hospital? Detectives had many leads to follow. The puppy, the jacket, the blonde hairs and fibers, and the motel key. They got to work trying to figure out exactly what it all meant. Investigators tried to track down where the puppy came from, but they were unable to find its original owner. Ultimately, one of the responding officers adopted the puppy and named her Katie. Later, a sample of her hair and blood were both taken and placed in storage, just in case they were ever needed in the future. With no logo on the key card, 
Detectives went to every hotel and motel, trying to match it to a place, but they had no luck there either. No one recognized the card. All of the other items were untraceable as well. Investigators, friends, and family found the whole situation to be very frustrating, especially Denise and Brandy. Finding Zeb's car had given them a moment's joy of hope, but now they had more questions than answers. Hoping for more leads, detectives reached out to the public and asked them to call in and report if they had seen Zeb's car between January 2nd and January 16th. It wasn't long before a couple called to report that at some point during that time frame, they saw a blonde woman driving a 1990 light blue Mazda in the area of downtown Asheville. The couple knew about Zeb's disappearance, so they wrote down what numbers they could make out on the license plate. However, they didn't call the police until they heard that police were looking for more information. They gave police the partial plate numbers, which were a match to Zeb's Mazda. The couple then helped a sketch artist put together a composite drawing of the driver. Detectives later told Disappeared that the sketch closely resembled none other than Misty Taylor. Misty was brought in for questioning, but she denied driving Zeb's car. She said the couple must have made up the story about seeing her, or that it wasn't her in the car. Detectives didn't believe her, but they didn't have enough to arrest her on. I've gotta say, for what it's worth, eyewitness testimony is very unreliable. And why wouldn't these people have called in the tip right away? Zeb Quinn's disappearance was front-page news. Would they really wait for the police to ask for the public's help? And every time I've seen that sketch, I have never seen a photo of Misty side by side with it. It seems strange that after all these years, no one has given up a photo of Misty for comparison. That's what I meant earlier about giving you her description. It's pointless when you look at the composite sketch. There's something hinky about this sighting. I don't know why detectives would put much stock into it except that they were grasping at straws to find Zeb Quinn. Admirable, but some tips are misguided, especially for people who supposedly wait to call them in. But at least now investigators were positive that Zeb was not a runaway. They feared foul play was involved, but they didn't have any solid evidence to back up their theory. They would have to just keep digging. Meanwhile, Zeb's mother and sister were beside themselves with worry. They knew from the beginning that he hadn't run away, but the gravity of the situation was starting to settle in, and it was too much to bear. In late January, Denise sat down for an interview with the Citizen Times. She talked about how she couldn't sleep at night. She would lie awake, wondering where her son was. Sometimes, she found herself looking at his pictures, talking to him, begging him to please call, please call. By the late summer, Denise was starting to accept that she may never see her baby again or find out what happened to him. She told the Citizen Times that she knew for a fact Zeb would have reached out to her by now if he was still alive. She said, Zeb once told Brandy that I was all he had in this world. I know he would call me. I know it. Denise added, I'm angry at the people here that I know know something, but who won't say anything. I just need to know whether he's dead or alive. I just need to know whether I should grieve or wish him well. If someone would just drop an anonymous note or tell us where he's buried, I just want to be able to find some peace. That anonymous note would never come. For the one-year anniversary in January 2001, Police announced they had no concrete evidence of foul play, so they technically considered Zeb to be a missing person. But they did not believe he was a runaway. Detectives were sure Jason Owens knew what happened to Zeb, so they kept trying to find enough evidence to charge him. More than a year and a half later, Jason had a run-in with the law, but not in connection with Zeb's disappearance. On the night of October 29, 2002, an officer tried to pull Jason over on suspicion of driving while intoxicated. But Jason didn't stop. 
and instead led the officer on a high-speed chase down the interstate, reaching speeds of more than 120 miles per hour. After some time, Jason exited onto Long Shoals Road, and then he stuck his arm out of the window and began shooting at the officer. The chase came to an end after he sped through an intersection, crashed into a mailbox, and flipped his truck. Jason was taken to the hospital where he spent the next nine days recovering from his injuries he sustained from the wreck. After he was discharged, he was transported to the police station where he was charged with nine counts, including eluding arrest and assault on a law enforcement officer with a firearm. He later entered into a plea deal where he pled guilty to eluding arrest and a DWI. The other charges were dismissed, and Jason Owens was sentenced to four years in prison. After Owens started serving his time, Asheville police wanted to speak with him about Zeb's disappearance, but his attorneys said no. Detectives still kept investigating him about Zeb. They were also trying to find a link between Jason Owens, Misty Taylor, and her boyfriend, Wesley Smith. For the fifth anniversary of Zeb's disappearance in January 2005, detectives put together a reenactment based on what Owens said had happened. It was the first time Asheville police had ever done such a thing. Detectives distributed the video to the media in hopes it would bring in tips. They said, quote, There is not a week that goes by that we don't think about the disappearance of Zeb. We will never stop investigating this case. They said they had searched ponds and buildings and taken cadaver dogs out, but they hadn't found anything. That month, Brandy and Denise spoke with the Citizen Times again about what they thought happened to Zeb. They both agreed he was probably dead and had likely gotten into some kind of scuffle that had gotten out of control. Brandy said, My brother's only downfall was that he was naive and gave everyone the benefit of the doubt. I think he was placed in a position he didn't see coming and didn't know how to get out of. Less than two years later, Jason Owens was released from prison. He didn't stay out of trouble long, though. On January 1, 2007, he was arrested for habitual impaired driving. A month later, he was arrested again this time for resisting an officer and drunk and disorderly conduct. He was sentenced to serve 45 days in jail. In April, Jason Owens was released yet again. Around that time, detectives used ground-piercing radar to search his rural Leicester property. They never released details on what new evidence led them to that search, but they obviously did not find anything because they didn't arrest Owens. Before 2000 was over, Jason Owens was involved in yet another high-speed chase with police. He was convicted of eluding arrest and resisting an officer and was sentenced to serve up to 17 months in prison. In the summer of 2009, he was released again. He managed to stay out of trouble, at least for the time being. In 2011, he married a woman named Samantha. By January 2010, Ten years had passed since eight-year-old Zeb Quinn mysteriously disappeared, and Denise spoke with the Citizen Times about how she was holding up. She said she was sure there were people in Asheville who knew what happened and could help, and yet they stayed silent. Denise was desperate for closure. She said, Just not having anything is torture. It doesn't go away. Detectives also spoke to the media for the 10-year anniversary. For the first time, they publicly stated they thought Zeb had been murdered. They also said they didn't think his killer worked alone. Two years later, in 2012, Zeb's case was featured on an episode of Investigation Discoveries Disappeared. Several tips were called in, but none of them led to anything solid. Investigators continued trying to tie Jason Owens to Zeb's case. Tragically, before they got the chance, he would be linked to another disappearance. Only this time, there were two missing people, Christy and J.T. Codd. Christy Schoen was born in September 1976 to military parents in Madrid, Spain. She grew up in Biloxi, Mississippi, and often cooked Cajun food with her dad 
something that became a lifelong passion for her. She graduated from LSU with a double major in German and performing arts, and then moved to California in search of a career in Hollywood. She started out with a few small acting roles and chef gigs on movie sets. When she wasn't working, she was outside her apartment, grilling for everyone who wanted something to eat. As her career progressed, Christy began taking on head caterer jobs on big-budget movies like Dawn of the Planet of the Apes, Terminator Genesis, and Geostorm. Sometimes, in addition to being head caterer on set, Christy would also work as a stunt performer. She was a jack-of-all-trades, an incredible talent. Then, in 2012, Christy made it onto Season 8 of Food Network Star. Although she was the first one cut, just making it onto the show was a huge honor and success for Christy. A family friend said, So many may know Chris from her different TV shows on Food Network or other acting bits, but she was much, much more than some Hollywood type. She truly loved to make others happy. Nothing made her happier than cooking and making other people happy. While working on the set of the TV show Without a Trace, Christy met her future husband, Joseph J.T. Codd, who was born in September of 1969, making him almost exactly seven years older than his wife. J.T. grew up in Gaithersburg, Maryland, before he moved to California. There, he started working as a grip, handling cameras and other equipment on set. When he wasn't working, J.T. was helping the needy and backpacking in Costa Rica, Nicaragua, and Thailand. J.T. was a remarkable person, just like Christy. His brother told the Citizen Times that J.T. had no friends because all the people who knew him were all his family. That's how he treated everybody. He went on to say, J.T. was as genuine as a man could be. He was an example of unrelenting empathy. I've never heard that phrase before, unrelenting empathy. But it's lovely. In 2013, Christy and JT decided to leave the big city life behind and move to a quiet place where they could get married and start a family. They settled on a 36-acre property off Hooker's Gap Road in Leicester, North Carolina. Friends told People Magazine the couple's eventual goal was to create a self-sustaining farm and open a farm-to-table cafe. The couple fit in well in their new city. Everyone who met them couldn't get over how generous and kind they were. A neighbor told the Citizen Times, quote, They were so loving and kind-hearted. You could not have asked for two better people. They were so talented and had a bright future before them. JT and Christy both had big, trusting hearts. They wanted to help those struggling in life. So they hired a few people to help them fix up their home and property. It wasn't long before they met and hired handyman Jason Owens, who lived about a mile away. At this time, Owens had been in and out of prison for DWIs, eluding police, and selling drugs. He was definitely struggling in life, which is what drew Christy and JT to him. Friends of the couple later told People Magazine that they were sort of taken aback by their friendship with Jason Owens. One said, I remember him being kind of weird just not being the kind of people that you would find around JT and Christy. Another friend said, There was a gut feeling when I looked at this guy, and I avoided him. This was one person I definitely did not want to meet. According to friends, as time went on, Christy started having more concerns about Owens as his behavior grew more and more weird. But JT wasn't the type to see the bad in someone, so they continued hiring him to help around the house. In October 2014, Christy and JT married, and soon after, Christy found out she was pregnant, and she was due that July. She and JT were so excited to start a family in their new home. Later, they would find out they were having a baby girl, who they named Skylar. But they never got to meet their baby girl. On March 15, 2015, at around 3.30 p.m., Christy's father, Bill, called the police to request a welfare check on 38-year-old, five-months-pregnant Christy. She was supposed to have visited him that day in Mississippi, but she had never shown up. 
When Bill called to see where she was, he was unable to get a hold of her or JT, and he said this was very odd behavior. It was unlike Christy to not only not show up, but also not answer her phone. And JT not answering was even more concerning. JT had also had plans to go have beers with a real estate agent. When he didn't show up, the man kept trying to reach JT, and when he got a response, it was actually from Christy's phone and said, Sorry, we both have this stomach flu, throwing up and such. We both have been just trying to sleep it off. Patrol officers responded to the Cod residence. Upon their arrival, they noticed three cars parked outside, a sign that someone should be home. But no one answered the door. A neighbor had a spare key so officers could conduct a full welfare check. This neighbor was named Cecilia Owens, who happened to be related to Jason Owens by marriage. Officers searched the whole house, but they didn't find Christy or JT. Instead, they found terrible signs that something was wrong. The couple's dogs had been left unattended. There was no food or water, and the dogs had urinated and defecated all over the house. Also, Christy's purse and JT's wallet were inside, but a medicine cabinet had been left open and some bandages had been removed. Something was clearly wrong, so the residence was secured by officers and a missing person investigation ensued. Detectives started the process of obtaining search warrants for the home and property. They also sought out phone records, which would later show that JT and Christy had not used their phones since March 11th, four days prior to the welfare check. Furthermore, records showed some of JT's final text messages that day were exchanged with his 37-year-old neighbor and handyman, Jason Owens. At around 8.30 p.m., Detectives were searching the Cod home and property when they received a report of suspicious activity currently going on on Donna Drive in the Candler community, eight miles from the Cod's home. The caller reported seeing a suspicious man throwing garbage bags into a private dumpster. Investigators responded to the report and recovered the trash bags. Inside, they found items belonging to Christy Cod. Detectives spoke with a caller who gave them a very detailed description of the man with the trash. The description led detectives straight to Jason Owens. In the early morning hours of March 16th, detectives went to Jason's home and interviewed him. He finally admitted to breaking into the cot house and stealing the items he was seen putting in the dumpster. Following this confession, detectives took Owens into custody and transported him to the station for further questioning. There, Owens was asked about the Cods and their disappearance. And he admitted to killing them on March 12th and what he claimed was an accident. He told detectives that he went over to the Cod house that day after JT got his 2008 Dodge Ram truck stuck at a nearby creek. In an attempt to help free the truck, Jason got behind the wheel. Christy and JT were standing in front of the truck when Jason said, he accidentally hit the accelerator and ran the couple over. He told detectives he then backed over them because he knew what he had done. Once both Christy and JT were dead, he said he took Christy's body inside the primary bedroom of the cot home and temporarily left her there. Next, he said he took JT's body to 8 Cohen's Cove Road. At this point, his grandmother had passed away so the trailer was unoccupied. There, Owens said he dismembered JT's body with a reciprocating saw, a powerful saw often used in demolition because it can cut through wood, metal, fiberglass, and, so easily, human bones. When he was finished, Owens put JT's remains in a large plastic bag, leaving the bag in the empty home. From there... He said he headed back over to the Cod home, where he dismembered Christie's body in the shower, also placing her body parts in a bag. Jason then took the bag back to 8 Cohen's Cove Road, where he said he burned both bodies in the wood stove. He told detectives he dismembered and burned the bodies because he was worried he would face at least manslaughter charges due to his past record of drunk driving. He said, I'm not a bad guy. I didn't mean to hurt them. 
They were my friends. I loved them. But come on, if they were really your friends, even if it was an accident, could you really cut up their bodies and dispose of them in such a gruesome way? No normal person could. Even if it's vehicular homicide, most criminals would just run away. This sounds like the work of a psychopath and a shitty liar. Think about it. There's almost a professional detachment in the way he describes neatly cutting up the bodies and then burning them. But he gives some bullshit reason like accidentally running them over. It's bizarre. Owens also said he moved the Cod's cars and robbed their home after they were dead. He did this to make the crime look like a robbery. He didn't take their wallets, but he did grab a tan and black backpack and its contents, which were a laptop, a tablet, jewelry, a handgun, and a few other small items. And I think we should point out he could have ransacked the medicine cabinet for more than bandages, considering he was a frequent drug user, something his attorneys will later use in court. Owen sold most of the stolen items at two different pawn shops and a flea market. He used the money to fill up his tank with gas and take his wife out to eat at Cheddar's restaurant. The remaining items were thrown away in the dumpster, which, thankfully, finally led to his arrest. Following their interview, detectives set out to corroborate Jason Owens' story. First, they searched 8 Owens Cove Road. Just like Owens said they would, detectives found the remains of Christy and J.T. Codd in the wood-burning stove. I've covered cases where a body was burned before. It is very difficult to get rid of all of the remains by burning. There is always something left. Detectives looked over J.T.'s truck and didn't find any damage that would indicate the truck had been used to strike and kill anyone. However, detectives learned that Owens had been seen cleaning out the back of J.T.'s truck on or after March 12th. Detectives also spoke to Jason's wife of four years, Samantha. When asked what she knew about the Cod's disappearance, Samantha admitted that Owens told her he killed J.T. He was driving J.T.'s truck when he struck and killed him. Notably, court documents don't mention anything about how Owens said Christy died. It's unclear if Samantha didn't know how Christy was killed, or if that information just wasn't provided in the documents. Due to the inconsistencies in Owens' statements to police and his wife, he was charged with two counts of first-degree murder, the murder of an unborn child, dismemberment, breaking and entering, and larceny. The prosecution planned to seek the death penalty. Following Jason Owens' arrest for the deaths of the Cods, Many wondered if he would be charged with anything in relation to Zeb Quinn's disappearance. Denise, Zeb's mother, released a statement. She is always so eloquent, but this statement is also so thoughtful. Quote, We would like to ask the public to please not overshadow this couple's heartbreaking investigation with statements, posts, and questions about Zeb. We acknowledge and appreciate the abundant support we have always received from our friends and community, and trust you will all give the Cod, Schoen families the same gift. But four days later, on March 20th, authorities held a press conference to confirm that Jason Owens was a person of interest in the 15-year-old Zeb Quinn investigation. They said the arrest of Owens for the Cod homicides was a significant event in their investigation. Authorities also announced that around 2 a.m. the morning of the press conference, dispatchers received a series of 7911 calls about someone starting a fire at the unoccupied home at 8 Owens Cove Road. By the time firefighters arrived, the trailer was fully engulfed. They were unable to put the fire out, and the home was a complete loss. Detectives said they weren't sure if the arsonist was a friend or relative of Owens who was trying to destroy evidence, or if it was someone who just wanted to burn down the property because it was the scene of a horrific crime. They wouldn't say if the wood stove was still inside during the fire or if any other potential evidence had been destroyed. 
Eleven days later, they were back searching the 1.4-acre property for evidence with a team of Western Carolina University criminal justice students. Then the very next day, there was another fire. This one caused by a downed power line, according to someone from the Owens family. Friends of J.T. Cobb made a formal complaint to the North Carolina Attorney General about what they felt was a shoddy investigation by Buncombe County Sheriff's Department. There were hints about other members of the Owens family, rumors on Facebook, and they said that Jason had started a fight at the Cod's wedding on their property. They felt that the hill where the Cod home was in Leicester had one or more accomplices to the murders living on it and was also a corridor for meth dealing. Those are strong accusations, and the Attorney General's office said that by North Carolina law, they're not authorized to investigate the complaint against the sheriff's office. The SBI later said they were not asked or invited into the investigation by Buncombe County. But back to Jason Owen's connection to Zeb Quinn's disappearance. A week later, on March 27th, detectives met with Jason Owens' uncle, Gene Owens, after he contacted them to say he might have some information regarding Zeb's disappearance. During the interview, Gene told detectives that prior to and after January 2000, Jason Owens burned items in a dugout area on his own property. Sometime after January 2000, Jason poured concrete over this area. It was eight feet long by eight feet wide, and he claimed that he was planning to build a fish pond. But it was nowhere near the trailer where a fish pond might be enjoyed. Gene said the fish pond was never completed, and Jason later covered it in with fill dirt. Following their meeting with Gene, detectives applied for a warrant to excavate Jason's property in an effort to find the remains of Zeb. They now felt he could possibly have been dismembered and incinerated, just like the Cods had. The excavation of Jason Owen's property unearthed fabric, leather materials, an unknown white powder substance, and pieces of metal and concrete. Parts of the property were also probed and found to contain numerous plastic bags containing possibly pulverized lime or powdered mortar mix. However, Zeb's remains were not found. Maybe too much time had passed. He had 15 years to get rid of any remaining parts of Zeb's burned body. He didn't have that kind of time with JT and Christy. I think that's the difference. I also think that's why Gene waited to speak up for 15 years. Maybe he had his suspicions about his nephew, not only because he was a suspect, but because he had seen the fire on Jason's property around the time Zeb disappeared. Once Jason was arrested for the gruesome double murder, Gene could no longer ignore his conscience. He could have been wrong about Zeb, but this was too much. And wouldn't you know it, a few months later, Jason Owens told his attorneys that he didn't kill Zeb, but he knew who did, his uncle Gene. Jason said he had written a letter to Denise confessing all he knew about what happened to her son. In the letter, he described how on the afternoon of January 2nd, 2000, Gene showed up at his house and asked if he knew a Zeb from Walmart. After Jason said yes, Gene told him that Zeb had been talking to a girl named Misty Taylor. She had a jealous boyfriend who wasn't very happy about Zeb being so friendly to his lady. She'd be off a dirt road in the Pisgah National Forest just 10 miles outside of Asheville. Gene asked Jason to go to Walmart and tell Zeb about Misty's camping spot and then lead Zeb there once he was off work. I think this confession is bullshit, which I'll explain more in a bit, but I think he used public information to try and put together a believable story, not to mention implicate his uncle Gene, who had betrayed him by coming forward with information about Zeb Quinn. Anyway, Jason said he agreed to the plan. Late that evening, he went to Walmart and told Zeb that Misty wanted him to meet her that night and Zeb said okay. In his letter, Jason claims that Zeb then told him about Misty and how she had a baby with her abusive boyfriend. Zeb also mentioned that Misty's boyfriend had threatened him the week before. Okay, 
So then why would he take Zeb out there knowing Misty had a jealous boyfriend who had threatened Zeb? Except that these things were all public knowledge at that point. A lot of murderers follow their own stories in the press. Jason could have remembered the details or even saved clippings. Those would have been lost to the fire now. But back to the so-called confession. After Zeb got off work, the two men left the Walmart parking lot in their own cars and stopped for drinks. Then they headed out to the forest with Jason leading the way. They turned on the dirt road and then they drove for quite a ways before Jason saw Gene's truck parked off to the side. He drove past Gene's truck and then backed in beside him while Zeb parked his car in the road. All three men exited their vehicles and met at the back of Gene's truck. Jason asked Gene where Misty was, and he said she would be there in a few minutes. Jason said at that moment, Zeb turned to look down the trail, and Gene pulled out a twenty two rifle and shot him in the back of the head. Zeb spun around and dropped to the ground dead. Jason said he jumped in his truck, threw it in drive, and pulled onto the dirt road. In the process, He ran into Zeb's car and hit his head on the steering wheel, leaving a knot on his forehead. Before he could back up and clear Zeb's car, Gene ran around to Jason's driver's side door yelling, Whoa, 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 I'm not going to shoot you. Jason said Gene showed him that he no longer had the rifle in his hands. Jason then asked Gene why he had shot Zeb. He said Gene replied that Zeb had been poking his nose somewhere he shouldn't be. Someone had to teach him a lesson. Jason said he told his uncle he needed to go home. He had to work early in the morning. Gene told him not to even think about going to the cops. Jason wrote that Gene said he was an accomplice and his fingerprints were on the gun, and that Gene instructed him to go home. Jason said he followed Gene's orders and went home. He tried to sleep, but tossed and turned. At 3 a.m., he got up and headed to work, even though his shift didn't start until 6. On his way, Jason decided to drive to the dirt road and see if Zeb's body was still there. When Jason got there, he saw Zeb's car was no longer in the road. It was backed in near where Gene and Jason had parked during the shooting. However, Zeb's body wasn't there, so Jason decided he was in the clear. He continued driving to the next pull-off so he could turn around and head to work. But as he drove around a curve, Jason said he saw Gene, his truck, and a large campfire. Gene saw his nephew and then motioned for him to park and get out of the truck, which Jason did. While approaching his uncle, Gene noticed Zeb's legs hanging out of the campfire. Gene said, I see you have come to roast marshmallows with me. Jason said he replied, No, I was just on my way to work. Gene told him that since he came back, he had to stay until Zeb's body was completely burned up. Jason said he tried to protest, but Gene was having none of it. So he sat on a rock while Gene kept feeding the fire with a big stack of limbs. When Zeb's body was mostly burned up, Gene put the coals out with water from nearby Bent Creek and then he grabbed a shovel and disposed of the wet ashes in the woods. Once all of the ashes were gone, Gene picked up a big piece of Zeb's skull and told Jason he was going to bury it under the rocks in the water so no dogs could pick up the scent. Jason wrote in his letter that after Gene was done burying Zeb's skull, he told him to call in to work for Zeb later that day so no one would be suspicious when he didn't show up for his shift. Jason said he knew Zeb didn't have to work that day and then added he was probably going to lose his own job because they had a strict no-call, no-show policy. Gene told Jason to go to urgent care and say he had been in a car accident. That would give him a doctor's note, which he could then provide to his supervisor. Jason did as he was told and went to urgent care, where he complained about the knot on his head and sore ribs. After the doctor wrote Owens a note, he went to his job to turn it in. They accepted the doctor's note, and he did not lose his job. Later that day, Jason said he stopped by Gene's place. While there, Gene asked if he had heard from anyone, and he said no. Gene then told Jason he needed to call in for Zeb the next day. After Jason said he would, he left and went home. 
The next day, Jason said he used a work phone to call into work for Zeb, which led investigators right to him. Soon they showed up at his work, wanting to speak with him. At this point, it was the only real mistake he had made. In his letter, Jason wrote that after giving his statement to detectives, he went to Gene's house and told him what happened. Gene became outraged. He couldn't believe Jason had made the call from his work. Jason said Gene was so mad that he zip-tied his arms to a chair and threatened to kill him while he begged for his life. After pacing around for some time, Gene forced Jason to tell him everything he said to the cops during his interview. When he finished recapping, Gene said he would let him live, but if he ever brought his name up to the cops, he would kill Jason and his brother. Jason said he promised to never say a word, and Gene let him go. Jason wrote that over the years, Gene told him bits and pieces about some of the sneaky things he did to Zeb's car in order to throw off the police. Jason said Gene went to Kmart to buy a small jacket to plant inside the car. While in line, he grabbed three hairs off the jacket of a blonde woman in front of him. He planned on leaving them in the car along with the jacket and other stuff. Next, Gene took the jacket to a laundromat to wash it so it didn't look brand new. I mean, none of that really even makes sense. Who tries to steal hair from a woman in the line at Kmart? It is such a stupid story, and so weirdly specific to explain the jacket in the car, which, who cares? Fifteen years later, the cops still hadn't even identified it. What difference did it make? But Jason trudged on writing. On the night of January 16th, Gene drove 60 miles to Johnson City, Tennessee, and bought the puppy after finding an ad in the paper. Then, Gene went to the location he had been storing Zeb's car, the parking garage at the Mission Hospital. He moved the car to the barbecue restaurant parking lot, leaving the puppy jacket and blonde hairs inside. Jason said Gene hoped all of these items would send detectives off on a wild goose chase, which, if it was true, certainly worked, as investigators spent many hours trying to figure out the significance of all of those items. In his letter, Jason claimed that at some point, following Zeb's murder, Gene told him to go with his friend Adam to help him pass a drug test. While together, Adam confided in Jason that he was the one who got Gene to kill Zeb. Adam said he did it for Wesley, Misty Taylor's boyfriend. Jason claimed this was the last time he ever saw or heard about Adam again, even though before this, he was around Gene a lot. Years later, Jason was told that Adam took his own life. Jason claimed he questioned if that was true, insinuating that Adam was killed for telling Jason about his role in Zeb's murder. After Jason Owens wrote the letter detailing the, quote, truth about what happened to Zeb Quinn, His attorneys got to work trying to corroborate everything. Owens underwent a polygraph examination where he was asked two questions. Were you present when Zeb was shot? And did you see Gene shoot Zeb? Jason answered yes to both questions. According to his attorneys, he showed no deception. But let's remember, there's a reason polygraph examinations are not admissible in court. In their quest to corroborate Jason's account of what happened to Zeb, the attorneys interviewed over half a dozen people. Family members, former employers, co-workers, and acquaintances of Jean. They later said in a brief, quote, Nothing that they learned contradicted what Jason said. In fact, some of what they learned was chillingly supportive of Owens' narrative. Okay, sure. Or, it was convenient because Jason knew all these details from the many, many stories in the press. Jason's attorneys claimed that Gene hovered suspiciously close to the investigation for the next 15 years. For example, in 2002, after Jason flipped his car trying to elude police, Gene showed up at the hospital and insisted that deputies not question him about the Zeb Quinn investigation. The attorneys alleged that even after Jason Owens was arrested on March 16, 2015, Gene continued trying to butt into the investigation. They believed it's possible Gene was the one who burned down the home at 8 Owens Cove Road on March 20th. 
In a brief, they pointed out that at the time of Zeb's disappearance, Gene lived in the home. Maybe he wanted to get rid of evidence he left behind. Which is strange because investigators had said the home was vacant. So which is it? The attorney said that within two weeks of Jason's arrest, Gene again interjected himself by contacting law enforcement to give them the tip about the filled-in burn pit fish pond on Jason's property. Attorneys alleged Gene told detectives about the pond in order to misdirect the investigation into Zeb's disappearance. Or maybe, like I said, Gene could no longer live with this knowledge on his conscience. By May 2016, Jason's attorneys said they were done corroborating his account of what happened to Zeb. They felt his story was airtight, so they reached out to authorities and told them everything. Attorneys also let authorities know they could interview Jason Owens about Zeb. He wanted nothing in return for his confession. He just wanted to come clean. Efforts to schedule an interview were underway when, on the morning of May 29th, the district attorney made an urgent call to one of Jason's attorneys after finding out that Gene had made a troubling statement to a retired sheriff's deputy. According to attorneys, in his conversation with the deputy, Gene seemed aware of plans for law enforcement to look for Zeb's cremains in Bent Creek, and he spoke, quote, menacingly to the deputy about his, quote, house full of guns. For these reasons, the DA requested that the Owens interview proceed immediately. After everyone could gather for an emergency meeting, Jason began providing his account of Zeb's death to law enforcement. According to defense attorneys, Jason didn't get to finish his statement because authorities cut the interview short to go to Bent Creek and search before it got dark. They took Jason with them, but after searching for days, they were unable to recover any of Zeb's remains. But it had been 15 years. It's really unlikely there would have been anything left to find. Following the search, Jason's attorneys reached out to authorities in hopes of completing their interview but they didn't get a reply. After some time, the DA's office told them they did not want to meet with Owens again because there had been inconsistencies with his story. Yeah, I bet they were swimming in inconsistencies. Defense attorneys claim the DA's office never told them what these inconsistencies were. Nor did the DA's office release them to the public. But we have plenty of questions. Why was Gene so willing to murder someone for Wes Smith? What was Gene's link to Wes and Misty? Authorities never found any evidence that they knew each other. Why would Jason Owens lure Zeb out to meet Misty that night? Gene allegedly told him Misty's boyfriend was jealous. How did Jason not know something bad was going to happen? And just like with Gene, why the hell would Jason care that Wes was jealous of Zeb? He didn't even know Wes and Misty, and Zeb was supposedly his friend. The questions go on and on. Because authorities and defense attorneys weren't on the same page, nothing else would happen with Zeb's case for a while. However, they would work out a deal for the deaths of Christy and J.T. Codd. The DA's office felt it was in their best interest to let Owens take a plea deal. They said, quote, because there are no surviving witnesses and Jason Owens had exclusive control of the crime scene for several days, and he had nearly completed the gruesome project of cremating his victim's remains, we will never know many of the facts surrounding the Cod's deaths. I would imagine they were unable to even find a cause of death. It's difficult to piece together a murder mystery when you have nothing but mostly ashes left from the bodies and an unreliable and unbelievable statement from the murderer. The DA's office knew it would be difficult to secure a first-degree murder conviction at trial, so they reached out to Christy and JT's families and asked them how they felt about a plea deal. The families had tremendous reasons to agree. First, they wouldn't have to sit through a horrific trial. Second, by taking a plea, Jason had little hope for an appeal. And lastly, and most importantly, they would finally get Christy and JT's cremains released to them for a proper burial. Until that point, 
they had been stored as evidence. On April 27, 2017, Jason Owens entered guilty pleas to three counts of second-degree murder, the third being the Cobb's unborn child, and two counts of dismembering human remains and concealment of death. The robbery charges were dropped as part of the agreement, and he was sentenced to serve between 59 and a half and 74 and a half years, which was essentially a life sentence for the 39-year-old. At the plea hearing, defense attorneys claimed Jason Owens was psychologically and mentally impaired and on painkillers at the time of the cause's deaths, meaning he didn't have rational judgment. They also had the audacity to claim Owens had been diagnosed with PTSD following the disappearance of his close friend, Zeb. Before the hearing was over, Jason Owens addressed the court and stated, To the families of JT and Christy and their friends, I want you to know that I am sincerely sorry for the loss of your loved ones and the pain and suffering it's caused you. I'm grateful for you for the mercy you have left with this court to show me. I am truly sorry. Following the hearing, Christie's family released a statement that read in part, Frankly, we don't believe there is any punishment that exists that would be a justification for what he did. We can only hope that he suffers for the remainder of his life on earth and again as he rots in hell. What has happened has left a gaping wound in the heart of our family. According to Jason's attorneys, on the day after he was sentenced, detectives attempted to interrogate him about the disappearance of Zeb Quinn. He told the detectives that he would not answer any questions without his attorneys present. The detectives told him that they would contact his attorneys, but Jason's attorneys would later claim that they made no effort to do so. A few months later, on July 8th, Jason's Uncle Gene died from cardiac arrest at the age of 66 years old. Prior to his death, Gene publicly denied any involvement in the murder. I wonder about his so-called troubling statement to a retired sheriff's deputy, if it was even real. Maybe it was. Maybe he heard about Jason's letter and freaked out. We'll never know now. Two days later, Jason Owens was indicted for the first-degree murder of Zeb Quinn. Due to COVID-19 and other delays, there would be no resolution until 2022. During that five-year period, Owens' attorneys worked with the DA's office to come up with a plea deal. Authorities were not sure if Jason was telling the truth about what happened to Zeb. His murder was far too similar to the deaths of Christy and J.T. Codd. It was obviously possible that he killed Zeb alone and Gene was never involved. The defense tried to explain away the similarities, stating Jason only dismembered and burned the Cod's bodies because that's what he saw his uncle do to Zeb. But there were many other similarities between Zeb, Christy, and JT's deaths. In each of the cases, Jason was a friend of the victims and the last person to be seen with them prior to their disappearances. In both cases, Jason stated he was involved in car accidents with the victims at the times of their deaths. And of course, none of these accidents were reported to law enforcement. Also in both cases, after the victims had been killed, Jason pretended to be the victims in communications with others. He called into Walmart pretending to be Zeb calling in sick, and then he used Christy Codd's phone to answer a message from a concerned friend. In each of the cases, Jason Owens admitted to being present and being involved in the deaths, and there are no other confessed or independently verified eyewitnesses other than him, including his uncle Gene, who before his death vehemently denied any involvement, and there were no other witnesses other than his scum of a nephew to tie him to any of this. And finally, in both cases, the bodies of the victims were dismembered after their deaths and cremated. Then the remains were concealed. Only the cremains of the cods were left to be found because Jason was caught quickly. By the time the authorities had a story of what happened to Zeb, his ashes would have been scattered to the four winds. 
Despite the similarities, quote, based on the evidence available and the lack of motive and cause of death, the DA's office wasn't sure they would be able to secure a murder conviction at a trial for Zeb Quinn. After the DA's office spoke with Denise and Brandy about their concerns, they agreed a plea deal was their best option. On July 25, 2022, Jason Owens pled guilty to accessory after the fact a first-degree murder, and he was sentenced to serve a little over 10 years. Before the hearing was over, Denise read a victim impact statement. She talked about how Zeb's hard work and easygoing manner endeared him to people. He had grown up learning to trust people and believe in their goodness until they showed him otherwise. She continued, This is the young man that was taken from his family, friends, community, and the world. This was a young man that would never have seen his end coming. This is the young man who trusted his friend Jason. And for that, Zeb, just a sweet, innocent 18-year-old kid, was murdered in cold blood. When news of Owens' conviction and sentence was made public, many people were upset about how lenient his deal had been. In response to this inappropriate reaction to a family's extremely personal decision, the DA released a statement which read in part, It's my hope that anyone wishing to sensationalize today's plea will respect the family's desire for peace and privacy. After doing a little Facebook snooping, I saw that Denise made a post public, which read in part, This has been a nightmare for 22 years without answers that make sense. Though we do not fully believe the confession that was provided, we do believe at least portions of it. Jason is already slated to spend the rest of his life in prison, so what difference does this sentence make? Please don't make a hard thing even harder by ranting about how things should be. Today, Jason Owens is incarcerated in the Alexander Correctional Institute in Taylorsville, North Carolina. His projected release date is April 2074, when he would be 96 years old. As of this recording, he has not appealed any of his convictions or sentences, which would probably be pointless since he took plea deals. A lot of people still argue over the details, and I get it. Haley's deep dive showed her and me that Jason Owens likely came up with that whole confession letter from newspaper articles and the show disappeared and probably that future article in Spin Magazine. At least, that's how he kept Wes and Misty's names in the story. That's how he brought his uncle Gene in, too. He was pissed because Gene had finally caved and gone to police about his suspicions. The rest of that confession letter is basically Jason's confession about how he got rid of Zeb's body. He just said he watched Gene do it for revenge. But it was a stupid idea, because who would really believe that Gene would kill an 18-year-old boy as a hit for some guy named Wesley who he didn't even know? I think Jason maybe killed Zeb so he could rob him. I think his statement about going to look at a car could be true. Maybe he thought Zeb had the cash on him to buy the car, so he killed him in order to rob him. It could have been as simple as a fight that got out of hand. Jason telling Zeb that he was taking that money from him, and Zeb trying to stand up for himself, saying, just try to take it. Jason did go to urgent care with a head wound and broken ribs. You can get those from a fight as easily as you can a car accident. Maybe a fight that escalated, until he hurt Zeb too much, until Zeb was dead and he had to somehow get rid of the body. Then he systematically burned Zeb's body on his property, maybe again using a reciprocating saw or bone saw. Whatever he did, he had plenty of time to do it. The best lies always have a bit of truth woven in. I bet Zeb did flash his lights at Jason that night. Maybe it was because he had been paged and needed to stop, or maybe he did realize he was going in the wrong direction. Maybe this is when Jason said he was going to take Zeb's money. 
The thing that sticks out to me about his confession letter is the detail about how after Zeb's body was mostly burned up, Jason claimed Jean cleaned up the ashes with a shovel and disposed of them in the woods, possibly putting part of Zeb's skull in Bent Creek. It's just as easy to believe Jason did that himself. It's just so specific. There are still questions, or puzzle pieces, left out of this proverbial box. Who sent the page from Aunt Ina's house that night? Who called her from Jerry's apartment? That will always bug me. But if I'm honest, that side of Zeb's family wasn't entirely stable. Jerry Quinn said some very violent things about his sister in that spin article that he would cripple her if he found out she had anything to do with Zeb's murder. And then she ran for the hills, literally. North Carolina and Tennessee are separated by the Blue Ridge Mountains and the Great Smoky Mountains after that. It creates the natural border between the states. Aunt Anna suddenly took a job in Tennessee after that spin article. But not until she threatened Denise, Zeb's mom, with a defamation lawsuit if Denise said anything else about her in the press. Whether she ran from her brother or ran from guilty knowledge is anyone's guess. I think it was from her brother. And Jerry also made threats about Wes Smith, that he would choke the piss out of him. Jerry Quinn died on Christmas Day in 2013, so whatever he knew about Anna, he took with him. But he made no bones about the fact that he thought the police were idiots, and he really bought into the jealous boyfriend theory. It's sad that he died just two years before the truth started unraveling. And we didn't look too much into Anna. I really don't think a page from her house means she was involved with murder. I think it's likely Misty snuck over there to Paige Zeb to get away from Wes and her family. Maybe that was the urgent Paige Zeb needed to return And maybe he did go to his dad's apartment to try and call her back. And Jason lied about the whole timeline. All he did was lie. So why should we believe his timeline of that night? And I guess it will always rankle people that Zeb tried to call Misty on the last day he was seen alive and forgot to mask his number with Star 67. I get it. They were talking, and more than one person characterized Wes Smith as abusive. For the record, Misty wound up marrying Wes and having two more children with him. I think this last call from Zeb is just a coincidence. I think they were all very young. Misty may have been unhappy in her relationship, especially if it's true that Wes was abusive at that time and she was enjoying the wholesome attention she got from Zeb Quinn. I think I've already tried to discredit the witness sighting of her driving Zeb's car and that strange police sketch. But I also want to point out that I do believe detectives did their due diligence following up in Zeb's case. I think that's why Misty was asked for a DNA swab to test against anything in that car. And, considering the statements police made, if they could have tied her to that car, I think they would have made an arrest. But it wasn't there. Because she wasn't there. I hate to over-rely on Occam's razor, but in this case, it feels necessary. I've already gone over the similarities between the Cods and Zeb exhaustively, but here's the thing. Jason Owens remained a person of interest in Zeb's disappearance for 15 years, right up until he killed the Cods. If his story about Uncle Gene is true, why on God's green earth did he not implicate his uncle Wes Smith and Misty Taylor and all of those 15 years. He had been in trouble many times, and I don't think it has been stressed enough in some news reports and other shows, but it would seem Jason had a major drug problem. His attorney said as much, painkillers to be exact. The opioid crisis was just beginning during that time. How many DWIs did Jason get? And who shoots out the window at cops unless they are major drug dealers really trying to get away, or unless they are so strung out and paranoid that they think they have no other choice. I am definitely not making excuses for Jason Owens. I think he is a murderous piece of shit. 
I do think that Zeb's murder was impulsive, the product of a fight. Too many people saw them leave Walmart together. Jason wasn't that stupid. His attempt to call in sick for Zeb showed his desperation. And I bet like Zeb, he just forgot to hit star 67, so Patty couldn't have tracked the call back to his work. But whatever happened with the CODs feels much more sinister, more planned. Maybe it was a robbery, and they caught him in the middle of it. But my true crime brain immediately went to sexual assault when Jason's wife, Samantha, didn't say how Christy was killed. And because Jason said he moved Christy's body to his bedroom and then went and dismembered JT before he came back for her body. I could be wrong, but his separating of the bodies, saying she lived a bit longer, it's all very strange and very dark. Which may be another reason the families were okay with the plea deal. They didn't want the details in the public domain. And that's fair. I think the point is, Jason thought he got away with Zeb's murder because of burning his body. But he didn't have time to get rid of what was left of the Cod's bodies in his stove before the police were onto him. I think it's that simple. And the simplest answer is usually the right one. Except, and I still struggle with this one, who burned down Jason's trailers on his property while he was in jail, destroying whatever evidence was left? Maybe the friends of the Cods were right, and there were other Owens' relatives willing to look out for their own. But there's no proof of that. Now. So this piece of the huge puzzle still bothers me. So much of this case bothers me. I think some is common sense, but we will never really have proof. As the Rolling Stones said, you can't always get what you want. But if you try sometimes, you just might find you get what you need. And we needed closure in Zeb's case. Jason's plea deal gave us that, even if it didn't give us the details we wanted. Take comfort that his mom and sister felt at peace with the plea deal. Remember, they are the only ones who really matter when it comes to who deserves to know the full truth. And as far as they are concerned, they got what they needed. Southern Fraud True Crime is hosted and produced by me, Erica Kelly. Today's episode was researched and written by me and Haley Gray. As usual, any editorial comments and opinions are my own. Southern Fraud's original music is by Rob Harrison of Gamma Radio and the original graphic artist by Cully Horner. If you have any case suggestions, please go to my website and click on the listener suggestion tab. This is the best way for me to get those little-known cases y'all always send me. Please remember I do not accept suggestions on social media private messaging. With three platforms to manage, that is very overwhelming for me. I hope you understand. But please come join our Facebook group, Southern Fried True Crime Fans Discussion Group, where we swap recipes, worship Dolly Parton, and share memes. I much prefer spending my social media time in our lovely group. We do, of course, discuss true crime, not just Southern fraud, but all kinds. Our group is a safe and fun corner of Facebook, and by God, we mean it when we say no shit ass is allowed. It's not just a motto, it's how we run the group. If you enjoyed today's show, don't forget to subscribe and please tell a friend or rate and review on iTunes. I'm also on all large platforms like iHeart, Stitcher, and Spotify. And now, Amazon and Audible. Until next time, thanks so much for listening. Y'all take care.